much and welcome to this discussion today. We have a great panel here of experts and we have one empty seat which is going to be filled with someone from the audience. Before we get started, this next panel is going to discuss internet freedom or net neutrality. We're seeing basically two big developments. In the West, um, we see discussing, we're discussing infrastructural net politics um, with the FCC, but also in the EU, while in the global South and in developing countries, we're seeing societies that are becoming more and more dependent on zero rating and Facebook zero as the internet, essentially. So the bigger question of this discussion today is really how can we bring advocacy efforts together on a global scale? I'd like to introduce my panelists, my experts. Um, first, we have Greta Byram, who is an advocate for digital justice. She is the co-director of the New Digital Equality Laboratory at the New School. And they just re recently published a report which is called Take It or Leave It, How NYC Residents Are Forced to Sacrifice Their Online Privacy for Net Access. She also supports community wireless um, and is looking into turning grassroots um, tech solutions, uh, turning more towards grassroots tech solutions, and was previously um, working on resilient community programs at New America to build um, storm-hardened Wi-Fi. Very interesting profile. Next, we also have Jay Ferrado, who's been to the Republica a couple times before with the gig as well. He is a digital rights advocate. He's a founder and CEO of Launch Garage, which he will be presenting to us in just a moment um, to a certain degree. And the Launch Garage is a hub based in Manila in the Philippines. Um, he also founded a Wi-Fi hotspot in 2002. I found that a very interesting fact. Um, and he was introduced to me as a tech guru and as a startup expert. Um, first, I'm going to hand over over to Jay to give a brief input on what the situation is like in the Philippines. Over to you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. <laughs> okay. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm, I hope I'm not taking you away from your lunch. But um, I think I've, I, I have a very interesting story. Uh, Yolanda um, painted a very um, um, accurate um, uh, view of uh, net neutrality from the Western perspective and the Global South. Um, coming from the Global South, I have um, a more um, uh, close to the ground experience with how it affects society um, and how it affected our, uh, our uh, elections and how it's continuing to affect how um, we live under the current uh, government that we have now in the Philippines. So, um, before anything else, I just found out today that it's World Press Freedom Day. So, um, I don't know if you knew that. If you're going to tweet anything now, just please use this hashtag too. And um, just to paint a, a picture of what net neutrality is in the Philippines, um, I'd like to read this out, bear with me. Um, this is from one of our telcos, global mobile phone providers. Globe Priority Network ensures that Platinum customers are always placed ahead so that their mobile data experience is always better than the rest. When using the same cell sites as other Globe mo mobile customers, Globe Platinum customers can enjoy double the data speed of regular postpaid and even four times faster than prepaid. They did not even bother to camouflage their marketing messaging. <laughs> That's how it is in the Philippines. We have no net neutrality at all. It's a, it's a matter of fact that if you, have the, if you can pay a premium, you'll get better service. So let me, uh, well, just for proof, it's not fake news. Here's some, uh, it's actually on the FAQ. And you can check it out on globe.com.ph. Um, in the Philippines, the internet penetration is 58%. And that translates to 61 million people. That's pretty huge. Our Facebook penetration is 56% with 59 million people on it. And of the 59 million people, 97% of them use Facebook on mobile. And for these people, that's the way they get their internet. In July of 2015, this happened. We got free basics. And this pretty much 
happened on the eve of our presidential elections. I remember I was here in the, just before the elections, and we were talking about how it's, it was going to change the shape of society, how we would live if the, the current president that we have now would win. And uh, true enough, we are living in a certain uh, specific, uh, in, a, in a certain atmosphere. But going back to Facebook Basics, it came in July 2015, and a lot of candidates made use of this. Why? Because a lot of critical judgment, a lot of conversations, debates, discussions were based on the headline. Because people could not click through the headline to get into the article itself and discern, find out if the source was credible or valid, if it was a real source or if it was fake news. So that was what was going to be driving the elections from this point forward. This is one of the more famous, um, how do you call this, uh, bloggers, uh, supporters of the current president, where even, even during the elections. She was a blogger and a very uh, solid Duterte supporter. And this is her Wikipedia fake news entry. This actually happened last month when some guy started putting all the occurrences of fake news that she was propagating. Um, and on that day, there were actually supporters of Duterte that were trying to take it down and people that were writing this, putting back on until somebody finally locked it down and no more edits could happen. So you can find this on Wikipedia. And Pardon the, the visual, but this is one of the most famous fake news mm. uh, items that she posted or reposted on her Facebook page, which had millions of followers. This is a claim that this was a young girl raped and killed by a drug addict, and she was using this as an image to go after the Human Rights mm. um, Commission on Human Rights. Um, and using this as proof that we should have a strong authoritarian government to prevent this type of, of uh, crime. Unfortunately, this was actually stolen from a 2014 news post in Brazil. This is, a, this is a, an event that actually happened two years before in Brazil. And uh, that's uh, one clear example. There's more. If you care to look, just check out her Wikipedia page. Now, Things have uh, started to come out of um, our country which tries to mitigate uh, this, uh, the fake news phenomenon. For example, Fake Block is actually an uh, initiative by uh, conscientious journalists, and it is a way for people to report URLs or domains that are notorious for being fake news sources. And they verify it, and then they enter it in their database. This is a Chrome extension that you can download, and it helps you not see the, uh, the um, fake news posts on the desktop. Unfortunately, I've yet to see this work on a mobile and in other browsers. I've seen, uh, I can't remember if it's uh, Bullshit Detector on Firefox, mm. which is another one which, mar which, which warns you whether or not this is a conspiracy theory, this is, a f this is fake <laughs> news or propaganda. That's another thing that I use. Um, recently, again, just in the last couple of weeks, Facebook um, uh, um, certified or accredited Verifiles and Rappler as fake news uh, reviewers. So they come in and look at Facebook posts, and then they flag whether or not this is fake news. Incidentally, these two publications which are independent news um, outlets and news sources, are mortal enemies of the current administration. And they are actually going after these two. And they, the, the, even the government um, raised a fit when they found out that Facebook certified these two news outlets as fact checkers. Um, this came yesterday, which is actually very good news. They're actually pulling out Facebook fee basics in Myanmar and other um, Global South um, um, 
countries or um, yeah, nations. Now, Myanmar is one of the most uh, stark examples of how face free basic, Facebook free basics can actually be super harmful because Myanmar has experienced the Rohingya genocide and a lot of people are attributing this to the hate speech that was propagating through Facebook. So, where is Moka Uso now? She's actually in the government. She was appointed by the president to be an assistant secretary in the office that dishes out government propaganda hmm. or communications from, from the government. And uh, uh, she's actually running for the Senate too next year. Okay, so um, that's it. That's my quick intro. Nice. Um, we're going to jump in straight into a panel discussion. Uh, and I hope uh, after this, you could also participate and ask your questions. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, hope to hear from you guys later. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to you. Greta, over to you. Hello. Okay. I would love to, for you to fill us in, um, now that we've heard about the Global South, what the Western perspective is. Um, for everyone who's been following net neutrality regulations, um, I don't know how you feel about it, but it's been a little bit difficult also to stay on top of everything. Perhaps you could give us a bit of a rundown of where we are right now with FCC and um, what it is that your work is doing to fight. Um, we're nowhere good <laughs> with the FCC is the bottom line. Um, so the, you know, thank you so much, Jay, for um, really painting a picture of the situation in the global south. Um, and I think, you know, we we have a real problem, obviously, with disinformation um, and that it's getting worse and that both um, zero rating and um, what's coming in terms of video manipulation and mm -hmm. audio manipulation is only going to make this worse. So I think the appropriate question, um, which Yolanda raised, is um, what are we going to do mm. all together about this? Um, so, and um, I kind of wear two hats. One is as a policy expert and the other is as a, a community technology practitioner. Um, so I'm gonna put on the policy hat to talk about net neutrality. So um, I think net neutrality is a really complicated and difficult concept. Um, and in the U.S., what we've seen is that in the last year, um, our Federal Communications Commission has reversed both the open internet rules of 2015, which prohibited things like, um, um, you know, different, different speeds for different rates of pay. Um, and they also rolled back privacy protections that were part of the open internet rules. And so in the U.S., essentially right now, there is no regulation whatsoever. Um, of uh, the internet service providers. Um, we also have a problem in the US of um, the platforms or the content providers merging and creating sort of giant mega corporations. So right now there is a Sprint and T-Mobile merger on the table and mm. what that's going to do is shrink essentially the mobile provider market to three. Um, in the U.S., which is kind of amazing for such a big country. Um, I'll also say in the U.S. that, you know, whereas, yes, we obviously uh, come from a really privileged position when it comes to technology and connectivity, at the same time, um, nationwide, about 30% of people don't have internet at home. Um, and so that's about 100 million people. Um, and that of those, um, those are mostly rural poor people. So poor people who live in old coal mining towns that are dying in Appalachia, for example. Um, and then urban poor. So, for example, in Detroit, about half of, of the residents of Detroit don't have internet at home. So the way that we're um, trying to deal with this is um, to encourage a a sort of mix of solutions, including community wireless, and then also trying to get 
um, different models of connectivity out to people who don't have it. And we are running into the same problem of zero rating. Um, and it looks like an unholy alliance between Jared Kushner, Mark Zuckerberg, and Sinclair Media. And if you haven't heard of Sinclair Media, that is the large media corporation. I mean, speaking of the um, freedom of the, what is the hashtag? Freedom of the Press Day? World. World. Um, Press Freedom. Press Freedom Day. <laughs> World Press Freedom Day, hashtag. Sinclair Media is the enemy. So they have bought up um, most of the local TV stations in the US, and now there are state um, sponsored messages that run on these, these local stations, and the anchor people have to read exactly what they say, or they will be fired, and in many cases, penalized legally and financially. So we really are looking at um, a situation where the platforms, the content providers, and the um, service providers are kind of coming together to create the perfect storm, um, which is, of course, also su supported by the ad tech, um, mm -hmm. the economy of ad tech. So um, I'm sorry to say that we don't have a better uh, picture in the US, and we certainly don't have any answers. Um, the thing that I'll leave you with is that as somebody who works in Detroit and Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx, these are all places with low internet connectivity, um, that to go into these situations and tell people, I'm here to advocate for neutrality is a really difficult proposition. Mm. So it's very hard to go to a community of color that's oppressed um, by white supremacy in the US and say, I'm here to fight for neutrality. That argument goes nowhere. Um, and also that the internet service providers have now found a way to say, we're providing net neutral service when they actually aren't. Mm. So net neutrality, because the open internet rules themselves are very complicated, it's easy for, say, Verizon to say, oh, we're going to give you um, net neutrality when actually they are going to price discriminate or they are going to block or they are going to put caps on or you know, they are going to prioritize certain types of content. So I think um, what I'm saying is net neutrality, I don't think is necessarily the answer. Um, and with so much respect and love for the people who have fought really hard for net neutrality um, and the open internet, I think we need to find a different language um, to advocate. <laughs> We have one open chair here, and as we're running out of time slowly, I'd like to invite questions from the audience. Um, we also have a couple of experts sitting in the room. Um, I would first like to have Stephen come on stage for his perspective. Stephen Kovats, um, Kovats is, um, runs the Agency for Open Culture and Critical Transformation and has been working in the South Sudan region, which he'll tell us about a little bit when it comes to net neutrality. There's a mic. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, and uh, for quickly racing me up to the, to the stage. Uh, we've got 10 minutes left, so I'm just yeah. going to slip a little quickie in. I mean, basically what we're dealing with is, is very much what um, Jay was talking about um, in connection with what Greta is dealing with. So if you take those things, um, you add a lot of guns uh, into it, and a very, very media mobile uh, diaspora, uh, you get hot conflict in South Sudan. Um, and we're facing a situation in South Sudan, so I'm Canadian, um, and I know a lot of Canadian South Sudanese who are engaged in their in their home country, um, and one of the issues there is how social media and now the zero um, platform scenarios are pushing a hot conflict there. And we're involved in um, in mitigating um, online incitement to violence. We have a special field guide for doing that kind of stuff, um, and we can't even start talking about uh, neutrality uh, issues because the situation there is that you have a very, very um, media-savvy diaspora uh, with very strong influence on a relatively uh, low infrastructure and media illiterate population on the ground in South Sudan. So when you infuse uh, an image that's taken from another conflict, just like you were showing, um, and you put it, of course, completely out of context, um, that actually does lead 
into one community, often attacking another and slaughtering them. So it's like, it's like genocide uh, issues. Um, and this is, I think, not really um, uh, part of the discussion around uh, net tr neutrality and these zero uh, options in Facebook. And so what we're trying to do is trying to make that more visible. So take this issue out of South Sudan and bring it into uh, places where it's maybe not on the radar yet. Can, can I just ask um, a question of the audience? How many of you know what we're talking about when we say zero rating? Can you just raise your hands? Okay, looks like about half, maybe a little yes. explanation would be good. Would you like to give an explanation? Okay, well, <laughs> well yeah, in, in the Philippines, uh, you can actually access Facebook without paying for anything. It's zero rated. So um, you have a mobile number, but access to Facebook is free with limited features. You cannot see photos, you cannot, um, um, you can't click through the article. So you, if, you, if, there's a, if there's a New York Times post that, um, that, some, that you see on, on Facebook uh, Free Basics, there's no way you can actually click on it and read the actual article. So you're, you're, you're just seeing the, the headline and whatever the headline is constructed as. So and whatever the headline is. Whatever the headline is. Some people call it a walled garden. Mm -hmm. So it's like you can see what's in the garden, but you can't get outside of it to compare it to anything else. Yeah. Maybe that's the point, too. Yeah. Opening it up to the audience, um, are there any questions that are... Or suggestions. What do you think would be <laughs> the way to address this? You know, yep. Oh, we also definitely start with a European perspective. I would maybe switch. Hi, my name is Dorothy Gordon. I'm from Ghana, where we have Free Basics operating. Hi, Stephen. <laughs> um, you opened by asking us to have a united platform, a united advocacy platform, but I haven't heard anything coming out of you as to how we're going to do that, because we definitely need it. So if you could expand on that. Um, okay, well, I guess the, uh, the sense of um, a united platform is really a um, sort of like a symbolic one rather than a, mm -hmm. than, than a tangible one. Um, right now, we are in the conversation where we're trying to define um, uh, the, the context of, of uh, net neutrality and zero basics, free basics. Um, and we've got all sorts of angles, the, the, the industrialized world side, the global south. Um, I think our quickest win right now is to actually recognize that, that um, it's harmful. Because us in the global south, we know it's harmful. We see it every day. People die. Um, so um, maybe as far as we're concerned, we'd like the rest of the, the world to recognize this as well. Because in the reason that I actually wanted to do this talk is because I've been speaking with a, a lot of people about it and it seemed like they were surprised that this actually happened. Mm. The, the whole concept of um, um, you know, somebody winning an election based on headlines flying around on the internet. That's totally weird. So um, that's, that's primarily my motivation for doing this. I guess the, uh, the, the, the second um, objective, the objective would be to um, extend the conversation to people like you, make, make you aware that this is happening, and then hopefully you can join the conversations too. And I'm going to suggest that we move on from the concept of neutrality. I'm going to say neutrality is not a helpful concept for us in advocacy. And that what we actually need to do is come up with the language that speaks to what we want when we say net neutrality. Do we want an open internet? Do we want an internet in which um, stakeholders have power over how it works um, on an infrastructural or a technical level? Do we want control over the platforms? Do we want to ensure that governments aren't using um, our internet for uh, state messages, oppression, authoritarianism. Um, there are many, many ways to, to use language to create an advocacy platform, and I'm going to say neutrality is not one of them. All right. Um, and there's one more expert in the room who has an EU perspective, Tom. 
yeah, I'd love to switch you out. Mm -hmm. For the last couple of minutes, Tom, your mic is right there. Tom, Thank could you briefly introduce yourself and then give us the EU perspective? Yes, uh, so my name is Thomas Loninger and I've been working on net neutrality in Europe more or less since the whole fight started uh, in, in the European Union in 2013. And um, I'm executive director of an Austrian digital rights organization called Epicenter Work and senior fellow of the Mozilla Foundation also working on net neutrality in Europe. Okay, and what is the um, EU regulator, regulatory perspective? So, I would say we made the same mistakes as the US because our rules on zero rating are weak. They are case by case, which means they are never applied against the telecom company. So, we haven't had a single case where a zero rating uh, discrimination was actually prohibited by a regulator, uh, although there are many of them. Um, like 86% um, of European countries have price discrimination. So it is a real problem, but it so far was not addressed. And at the same time, the telecom industry is really trying to um, yeah, split the internet up and uh, give it different price tags. So, and the most blunt example is Vodafone Pass. They actually warn you if you go outside of Facebook because, oh, you, this could be expensive for you. Mm. And also in Portugal, one of the... Um, uh, poorest telecom markets in Europe. Uh, we have uh, offers like SmartNet from Mail, which actually was quite viral in the US in December. And they also, they package up the internet into individual slices and make you pay for it. And these individual packages are far cheaper than the full internet. And uh, with such a tiered system, they still, and that's often the problem of zero rating, they appear as if you would get something for free. Mm. They appear as if you get the most popular websites for a far cheaper price. But the effect this has, particularly on poor people, is to lock them in, into these walled gardens of hand-picked applications and thereby circumvent the whole thing that makes the internet great. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to respond, and I totally agree. And I think the other thing that happens is that if you... Um, if you can pay for service um, and you can opt out of the walled garden, um, then you're not subject to some of the same kinds of data extraction, data mining, um, and those kinds of practices. So what I fear that we are looking at in the US in particular is that if you are um, from a vulnerable community and especially vulnerable to things like predictive policing, algorithmic sentencing, things like that, that your data, as by virtue of participating in zero rated services, your data will be much more consolidated um, and used against you. And I think that that is a good point to also talk a little bit about why Facebook is doing what they're doing with mm. internet.org and free basics. Um, for them, it, it makes economic sense. Uh, their revenue per user is far lower than the one of Google, their only real competitor. And so they have to expand their markets. And in Western countries, they are more or less saturated. In the whole internet, you could argue they are more or less saturated. So they have to extend the internet, but not the full internet. That's the basic idea behind Free Basics, to be the new free basic service for everyone. The old idea of the all incumbent platform. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that they are specifically targeting the most vulnerable groups in this world to make them accessible to marketing, to make them accessible to a form of um, surveillance via the technology that's utilized in these services, and then sell this data off or the attention to these people. If, I believe time is up. Yeah. <laughs> this was a very interesting talk, discussing the various perspectives of net neutrality, the problems from the US. We had a view from the EU, we had the view from the Philippines, and we even had South Sudan. So um, I'm sure that the audience still has a few questions. Please feel free to connect with the speakers once they get off the stage, and otherwise enjoy the rest of your time here at the Republica. Thank you. Thank you. Open and free, not neutral. What was that? I said... <laughs> I have a session.